Many years ago, I was working on a Disney movie which would then suffer an unfortunate fate. But this is another story. In this movie, characters had four arms. Four. At a certain point, I thought it would have been great to have the secondary arms animated to react to the main body motion and thus animate less keyframes. Maybe I thought the animation of the secondary arms could have been based on some sort of physics simulation, so I started writing a tool to do that. However, at the time I only had been scripting for two months. Plus, the movie was about to finish anyway, so I did not really go that far with this. However, it looks as if someone has finally cracked that nut and wrote a software named Ragdoll Dynamics, a physics-based simulation tool that lets you easily simulate secondary motion on any character. In this video I'm going to barely scratch the surface of what Ragdoll can do by using it to set up an automatic overlap on one character. The truth is Ragdoll has a number of features. However sad that is, I think it's worth pointing out that I have no connection with the development of this software, I just think it's a fun piece of software. At the moment of recording this tutorial, the software is available as an early access software which you can download and test for free. You will find a link to its web page in the description below. I think it would be really fantastic to just animate the master of a character like this one and get all of this overlapping animation for free out of the box and based on our current animated shot. So let's see how to do it. So with my rig in here and with Ragdoll installed, I have a bunch of options that I can use. So I will start by creating an active chain. And in a fashion similar to that of Overlapper, the tool expects you to select things in an order. Starting from the parent, we select the children of the chain one by one in the order that goes from the root to the last one. By the way, as a shameless plug, remember that I am live every Thursday at 5 p.m. UTC on YouTube Live and Twitch. This week's topic will be the do's and don'ts of remote work for animation and games with Max Bottega and Daniele Duri, who just finished working on Cyberpunk 2077 and Francesca Pesce, lead compositor at Blue Zoo Animation. Once we have the selection, we go into Ragdoll, options of acting chain. In here, you will find the option to create a new solver, which we want to do because we have no ragdoll in the scene just now. The initial shape will be auto. You will find that you will probably end up with capsules in this case. And then the root will be passive. We don't want the root to move around. We want to control that instead. And auto multiplier is good for us. In practice, these are the default settings as of now. I'm going to click on create an active chain. And now you see that a bunch of capsules have been created pretty much like those you find in video games really. Now let's have a look at how these guys are working. Right now if you press play you see that they go up. That's really bizarre as a behavior but you have to keep in mind that this stuff is simulated and usually when you are dealing with simulations there is a possibility that a floor is being used as in a floor you don't see which is used to simulate stuff and if we go and grab the RC node that the ragdoll creates then into the shape attributes on the right into the channel box you will find that you have the gravity of course but also we have use ground but we don't really want to use ground because this is a fish <laughs> and so uh, we're going to disable the ground and also we don't want to use ground not just because this is a fish but because the problem is that the ground is going to be here at the center of the grid and the fish is right there at the center of the grid so if we use ground the fish colliders are going to collide with the ground and if I now start again and press play you see that the fin the tail sort of goes down it flops down a little bit mm, that's quite cool if we we want to control the intensity, the strength of this pose, let's say, we can select the passive root, the first control we selected when created the ragdoll, and in there you find the global strength. If I lower the value quite a lot to 0.2, for instance, and I press play, you see that the tail flops down quite a lot more. Now I want this thing to feel a little bit more rigid, so I will go into the global strength and I will add, say, a dot seven to the attribute and in this case it stays it's flopping down but not so much so so if you experience unexpected behaviors after creating a ragdoll you really need to check the rc node and see if you're using the ground and if your character is into the ground and another thing that i think you really need to check is the animation preferences on the bottom right corner of the screen you see that there is this man running away from a gear he knows something we don't so let's click on it and in there we want to make sure that the playback speed is set to play every frame and also set the the max playback speed to the speed 
speed of your project. In my case, I'm testing things for a game engine, so 30 frames per second will do just fine. There you go, and now I am set. And that's because in Maya, if you want to see the result of a simulation, you need to have the playback speed set to play every frame. It's not a given that you won't be able to see the results if you're playing at, say, real time, but in practice, play every frame guarantees you you will see the right results. By the way, this fish model comes from an upcoming video game I might be working on. I will leave the link to its webpage in the description of the video. The fish has been modeled and textured, although you can't see the textures because this is just as much as I can show under the current NDA by Maddalena Del Vecchio. You will see the final result maybe in a few months and the art director behind the game is Francesco Mazza. You will find a link to their profiles in the description of the video. Now if I grab the master and I say move the master around and do a little bit of gymnastics with the rig, I expect to get overlap for free. Let's see. That's it. Not bad, it works. Now let's have a look at these colliders and let's make sure that we get a behavior that is more like the one we want. When you create your colliders with Ragdoll, in order to select them, you need to select the respective control. And into the collider, you find an R rigid shape which is the shape in which you will be able to select the behavior and the positioning of the collider. You will see that these colliders, they tend to collide with one another and there is a requirement according to the documentation for which there must be an intersection between two colliders in the point where the pivot of your control is. For instance, if I grab this collider and I reduce the length and maybe moved it away this way, then the simulation will no longer provide expected results, which is something that the author of the plugin expressly specifies. So we have to be careful about that overlap. Since these guys will collide with, with one another, maybe I can just rotate up these colliders. And this is a job that you only need to do when you set up your rig. And then when, once you reference your rig in all the scenes, those settings are already there and you see by operating on the shape length I can create a collider that is a bit more in line with the shape of my character. The important thing as I said earlier on is that this area which is the pivot of the next control is included in the previous collider otherwise the simulation would, will have a harder life computing. In fact it won't work probably. So there you go. So now I'm making you see my radius a little bit bigger just to include the previous collider but you see I have a bunch of controls to to rotate and that's going to take me a while but if you select them all and you can go into the end rigid shape of even one of them now you can go into the say rotation of one of them on, on any one of them and just input the values and you see that you're rotating all of them together which is a pretty neat feature because in fact remember that every rig has a bunch of controls I mean we are talking about maybe hundreds of controls so in here, I'm going to make sure that all of these colliders are overlapping with the pivot point of the immediately available controls, just to make sure that the simulation will run as expected. And then you see I'm scaling them up all together, but then I, I can deselect the, the one which is the parent in the current selection and just reduce the length and then deselect the parent reduce the length, deselect the parent, reduce the length. Not bad, not bad. Maybe this guy in here, I will need it to be a little bit bigger because it will have to intersect with the, with the tail fins. There you go, something like this. Now, if I press play, you will see that the tail stays a lot more rigid when we go up and down, but stays soft when we go left and right, which makes a lot more sense in my opinion. If I think this is a bit too stiff, I can reduce the global strength to say 0 0.5, press play, and you see that now we have a bit of a softer simulation. If I wanted the tail to be a bit softer when we move up vertically, all I need to do is to select all the controllers that I apply the ragdoll active chain to and decrease the shape length. If you find yourself in a situation where you try to change the shape length and nothing changes in the viewport, that's because you're not doing it in the bind pose. You need to be in the pose in which the rig was built to be able to apply this, or at least that's what I found out. Maybe the author is going to have another take on this. All right, now the colliders are set to be capsule colliders, but you can have 
all the sort of colliders there. I mean, now they are capsules, but they could be spheres, for instance. And this way you will see that the tail will be a lot softer. So it's down to you and your preferences, what you want to do. In my case, I'm kind of happy this way. I don't want the tail to be too floppy when we, when we move vertically, but I want it to be a bit floppy when we move horizontally. So that's good enough for me. Now let's do the tail section, the fin. If I grab this controller, which is just the one before the two fins, I can grab that controller as a root and then one of the fins and go ragdoll, active chain. In this case, again, the root is going to be a passive root and there's a shape. I want to have a capsule there as well. If I click on create the active chain, you see something is created there, but it doesn't quite work out of the box. And this is a bug with the current release. The author is aware of this and is going to change it. And remember, this is a software which is in the pre-release phase. In practice, this testing is also useful to understand where the bugs are. But you don't have to panic anyway, because the only thing you need to do is select the controller, go and rigid, and you will find that the radius has gone to zero and the shape has become a sphere. So all you need to do if you want a capsule there is to select the capsule and increase the length. And you see that when I increase the length and I increase the radius, I get to my capsule just fine. So it's just a matter of looking for things when things don't work. Then I'm going to rotate this guy and maybe <laughs> reduce the length a little bit and offset its X values. And I want to make sure that the roots capsule is actually overlapping with the fin pivot. Otherwise, it's not going to simulate the way I expect. So I'm going to increase the length a little bit of this capsule and that should work just fine. Now, as I press play, I should expect that guy to be simulated as well. But you see that that fin is moving together with the with the rest of the tail. So I want it to be a bit softer. I will get there in a minute. For now, I want to create a collider also for the fin in there. And I'm going to go ragdoll again, active chain, same bag as before, which is going to be corrected in the next version. And I'm going to go into and rigid and as a shape type capsule. In this case, I should have the colliders together. So maybe I can zero out the attributes of both and rigids and then go into the end rigid options and increase, you see the values together, make capsules out of both of them, increase the radius, and that's going to be much faster. So just like anything, when you deal with rigging or animation, you need to plan ahead a little bit all of your clicks, otherwise you will click forever and ever. Now I would like the fins to be a bit softer than the rest. And in fact, maybe I could make the softness of the tail progress towards the end of the tail, towards the tip. And if you select the control, you will find that apart from the usual transform attributes, translate, rotate and scale and so forth, you will find the ragdoll section and in there you will find the pose strength. The pose strength, as far as I understand it, seems to be the factor that makes the collider stick to the pose it was built in. So my understanding is that if I grab both controllers and I set the pose strength to say one tenth of what it currently is, say 0.05, I imagine that I will get a much softer tail there just for those two fins that stick out of the tail than the rest. Let's see if that's true. And you see that indeed they are now much softer. They are a lot wobblier than the rest. That's not too bad. So maybe I can go around and tweak the values of the pose strength, say maybe for this guy dot 35, then dot 30. In fact, why not maybe select these last three controllers and just lower the pose strength to say dot 45 or so, then deselect the root one of the selection, lower the pose strength a little bit, deselect the tail, lower it a little bit so that I get a progressive set of values that lowers towards the fin. And that should give me a bit of a better result with a bit of a softer part at the at the end if, if compared to the beginning. One thing that tends to happen with dynamic simulation is that very often you're happy about the way things move, but you would like them to stop after a certain amount of rotation. And I'm glad to say that this tool has that thing in mind. So if I select the two fins at the end of the tail and I go into the pose constraint there, you see that we have rotation and translation limits. 
that's good. So first of all, we need to make sure we evaluate the right axis. So to see which axis Maya is actually using, you hold down E like echo on your keyboard, left mouse button, and you go into gimbal. That's the true axis Maya uses when evaluating rotation. So let's say we don't want them to flop that much on the way up and down. We can go into the rotate limit Z and input say 30 there. And maybe we don't want them to twist quite so much on the, on the X, although we didn't really test it. So I'm going to put a 30 degrees limit in there. So now the tails will flop down, but they won't flop down, you see, nearly as much as they used earlier on. And this is how you set up a limit to the simulation. It is actually quite handy to have that kind of limit set up. And you can do the same for any control. So now I want to set up the left fin and I want to see how it works in terms of mirroring. As far as I understand it, there's still some work to do in terms of mirroring, but I think that's something that you will be somehow able to script if you really wanted to mirror an entire rig. But let's see how it works for the fin here. So root, child, and I go ragdoll, active chain, bam, done. And I do the same on the opposite side. Just press G in Maya and G like gold repeats the latest command. And now I select buff, sets of controls there and if i am not mistaken i should be able to click on and rigid and just decide you see you see i should be able to decide just in a single go how to set things but you will find yourself having to manually mirror things in my opinion unless there is a better way the first thing that comes to my mind when i see this thing is probably scripting so for these chains, I'm going to set a global strength of 0 0.05 again i want them to be rather floppy Let's see. But you see we are missing these two controllers. So let's go down there and do the controllers. It's exactly the same as the fin. So active chain, the same settings as before. And you will get, you will see the same problem as before. I think the issue is that when you have only two items selected, you're triggering this collider, which has a zero scale but that's not too much of a big deal in my opinion so i go into the end rigid and i change the type of to capsule increase the length increase the shape radius and then i will need to rotate these guys a little bit but it's probably better to do just the lower twins to start with so i'm going to increase the shape length in there and the problem is that when i will move the offset say this way for instance i will need to go on the opposite side and just minus that offset there you go. And that's how I get to the right position. I'm going to do the same with the upper twins and maybe move them out quite a lot more. As far as I understood it, the important thing is that the collider needs to fall within the pivot of the control so that both pivots of the origin of the root, this one, and the next available limb of the root are going to fall into the collider, which is not quite the case in here yet. So I'm going to grab these two colliders and I think I will have to increase the, the radius quite a lot in there and decrease the shape length to all practical purposes this has become essentially a sphere but in practice one thing that i could do in this case would be to just rotate the capsule and you see that this way i can have this collider end up on all the three pivots that it needs to cover which is quite handy which is in fact what we needed to do there you go so now i have to remember that this guy in here needs to be mirrored so i need to invert the values there and I guess I will want to make the tips a little bit softer. So I will select the controls, decrease the pose strength to dot three, for instance. And maybe for the middle control, I will decrease the pose strength to dot four. Now probably a good idea, now it's probably a good idea to save and I can press play. You see that now the fins are floppy. That's super cool and it's really neat it works out of the box that's great i mean i could go on forever and ever and this is really just scratching the surface of the ragdoll system because the ragdoll system can do a lot more than just automatic overlap it's just that the first thing i noticed was the overlapping potential in there because i kind of like this kind of dynamic behavior and i wanted to script a tool myself that did the same and although i did purchase overlapper I still find that I enjoy the physics simulation a lot more, although it does add complexity to the scene. I'm not going to do every single bit because you got the picture anyway. So I'm going to remove the calisthenics from this scene so that the animation you see doesn't happen anymore. And I'm going to save this rig. And in a new animated scene, I am going to reference this very rig 
and test how this thing would work in an actual scene where the rig, remember, is always referenced in the scene. You, you really don't have the rig important in the scene. So I want to see if I can store the dynamics into the rig and then reference the scene in an animation scene or if I need to import the simulation settings in an animation scene. One of the things dynamics don't really cope well with usually, and this has nothing to do with ragdoll, but it's more a general thing, is that if your character starts in a pose that is very, very different from the pose the dynamics were rigged in, you will see unexpected results in the simulation. So for instance, if I start with my animation, say in here, far, far away from where the rig was built and also in a much different pose. So let's say the animation starts in there and the fish is traveling forward and just flipping as it does. So twisting, I would rather say this way. So now let's have a look at the animation. As you press play, you see that the simulation at the beginning breaks a little bit. So that's a common issue with simulations and that's why I did this test because I kind of knew that. And that's the reason why in production animation rarely starts from frame one. Usually you will start your animations from frame thousand and one and in a second it will be clear why. So let's say that I start my animation instead of one, I started at a thousand and one. So I will have to go and, and move all of my keys a thousand and one frames in the future. There you go. So why do we start the animation at one? Because this way we can calculate pre-roll. So usually simulations perform better if you give the simulation a little bit of time to settle down in its newly found position before starting the simulation. And this is usually called pre-roll that I know of. There may be other jargon related to this feature. Anyhow, that means that at frame 1001, I have the first pose of animation, and then maybe I can use about 60 frames or so to go from the T pose, the character was dynamically rigged in and the pose of the animation there. And if you want it to be super accurate, not that we need it in this situation, you can maybe even copy the first key a few frames earlier, move it to the back. So to continue the motion that the fish will have at the beginning, so that imagine that the scene started a bit earlier than you, what you actually see in the final movie. And if we don't want to simulate the whole timeline until 1000, which we don't want to do, we can grab the ragdoll scene. And in there you have start time of the simulation. We start the simulation at 941, which is the first frame of our pre-roll. And now you see that if I press play, the simulation works a lot better and the overlap is calculated a lot better than before. So this, in fact, looks like a very solid system for simulating overlap on your character. Pretty solid indeed. In fact, it looks so promising that I think I will play with this software a little bit more because I think that using it to just calculate overlap may be a bit reductive. And once you're happy about your overlapping, it's time for us to bake the animation. Let's see how this works. If we go into the ragdoll menu up here, you can go under animation and in there, there is bake simulation. I'm going to go into the settings and in there, I'm going to disable the viewport so that while baking, Maya won't calculate the viewport. And this should speed up the baking. There are a couple of attributes here which are quite interesting. The lead physics is going to remove any reference to the physics nodes of Ragdoll and our roll rotation is going to prevent crazy rotations from happening. Sometimes controls going in the lock and they do crazy interpolations. I haven't tried it but I imagine that the lead physics won't work if you reference your rig because the Ragdoll will try to delete nodes that are referenced and it will fail at doing so. So I'm pretty sure I won't need that for now. So let's click on bake simulation wait a little bit as Ragdoll bakes the simulation down for us. And this is the moment of truth. Let's see. Now I can move the timeline and you see that the overlap works and it's stored onto keys. Mission successful. I think it's quite cool to see this in action with just a few clicks. I think that at the time of recording this clip, the software is still available as an early release that you can download and test for free. At the end of the day, the tool feels pretty solid. One could argue that the price could be a bit steep for a single animator who needs to do just overlap. And in my opinion, it is very hard to beat overlappers price. However, I do feel that with Ragdoll Dynamics, I have more immediate control over overlapping motion. And as I said, the video barely scratches the surface of the features and case studies of this software. If you head over to their website, you will find a bunch of examples that may enlighten you. So if you like this kind of stuff, I would suggest you give it a try because it could be fun. It certainly was for me. So I hope you have found this useful. Have fun.